Welcome to the virtual office hours. John Fia here, uh, chair of the history department at Messiah College. Megan Piet, as usual, behind the camera. Uh, welcome to episode number two in our fall 2014 office hour series. We are teaching, I am teaching a class this semester called the History of American Evangelicalism. Uh, Megan is in the class uh, along with four other students, so it's a, a tightly knit, intimate um, uh, five student class, uh, it's a reading class, a lot of reading, a lot of discussion. Uh, but we are also going to bring the class to you uh, this semester uh, through the office hours. If you remember last week on the office hours, I introduced you to uh, uh, the books uh, from the course. I'll put them up here again. Um, I did get them. I do have a copy of Molly Worthen too. I'll have to add that next time. Um, I found my copy. And, uh, and on or today, what we want to do is I want to summarize some of the things that we discussed in class on uh, last week, I think it was last Friday, uh, when we talked about, uh, had a sort of freewheeling discussion about the definition of evangelicalism and how, you know, or is it possible to defunct, to have some kind of working definition as we move through the class and think about the various ways in which evangelicalism has intersected uh, with American history in the 18th, 19th, 20th, and then into the 21st century. Uh, as many scholars are going to be aware, but maybe some of you are not aware, probably the most uh, popular definition of evangelicalism comes from uh, David Bebbington, uh, the uh, professor of history at Stirling University in England, and now also a joint appointment at Baylor University. Um, Bebbington, uh, the famous Bebbington quadrilateral, right? And evangelical is defined by four things. Uh, one, a commitment to conversionism, or a born-again uh, experience. Uh, two, activism, uh, or the idea that uh, evangelicals want to share the message of the gospel, they want to evangelize, uh, and even uh, uh, engage in some form of social activism as well. And we had a really interesting discussion, I think, about the ways in which uh, younger evangelicals are really merging the sort of evangelism and social uh, justice dimensions of that kind of activism. Uh, third, uh, biblicism. Uh, evangelicals have a very, very high view of the Bible and the authority of the Bible. They believe that the Bible is God's inspired word. Uh, it is a rule book for life. Um, again, evangelicals are divided uh, a little bit on this question between those who believe in the doctrine of biblical inerrancy and those who don't, but we'll pick some of these things up as we move on through the semester. Uh, and then finally, um, crucicentrism, or the cross. Uh, and Jesus' redemption, dying for the sins of the world on the cross, is a key part of evangelicalism. So we spent a lot of time with this definition. We went over it. What I found sort of most uh, uh, surprising was most of the uh, sort of 18, 19 to 22-year-old uh, students in the class really do not use the term evangelicalism to describe their faith. Many of them were very unfamiliar with the term. They had heard the term, but they wasn't, weren't quite sure how to define it. Um, I remember in my generation, you know, evangelicalism was, was very much a sense of uh, uh, a defining term, a term that gave uh, Christians a certain form of Christianity, uh, Christians' identity. Um, but most of the students here at Messiah College in my class did not really connect with that label at all when they thought about their own religious identity. So maybe we'll pick up more on that as the office, hour moves, uh, office hours move on. So there are a variety of ways we could define evangelicalism. We could define it theologically, what evangelicals believe. I suggested that we could define it culturally through much of the 19th century, I would argue. I mean, evangelicalism and American culture went hand in hand. It's really not till the fundamentalist modernist controversies of the 20s and 30s that uh, evangelicalism turns uh, inward, uh, begins to go sort of underground and form their own subcultural identities. So as Joel Carpenter has argued in his book, Revive Us Again, I wish we had time to read that book in the class as well. I originally was going to assign it. You begin to see in the 30s and the 1930s, 1940s, all kinds of uh, distinctly Christian uh, versions of culture. So Christians get their own schools and their own colleges and their own Bible institutes and their own uh, bookstores and their own youth ministries and their own radio stations and, and so forth. And now Christian music 
you know, all these all these kinds of things emerge uh, once you once you begin to see evangelicals have become a subculture. But that doesn't come till later, I think, in the class. But it played an important part, I think, in our discussion. And then finally, evangelicalism, I think, has a certain trans-denominational quality. Uh, you can find an evangelical in just about every Protestant denomination. Uh, even Catholics, some of them claim to be evangelical Catholics. So an evangelical is not necessarily associated with a denomination, like a Methodist or an Episcopalian or a Baptist, but throughout 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century America, evangelicals who embrace the quadrilateral can be found just about anywhere. So, again, it was an interesting discussion. We are picking it up this week with Harry Stout's book, uh, The Divine Dramatist. We'll talk about George Whitfield and evangelicalism in the 18th century, begin to historicize this concept of evangelicalism. Um, but for now, uh, you know, we at least have some things to work with as we move forward in the class. So thanks for watching. We will see you next week.